Pathology of Infectious Disease, and I'm going to, uh, I gave a little bit of an introduction last time. Um, I, 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 I'm not going to go back through all of that, but let me just remind you again of a, a, a bit about the infrastructure of ecology, or at least from my perspective as the lead in this class. And, and, and that is that it is all about the distribution and abundance of species of which disease organisms are a significant part. And I mentioned in the initial lecture that at least the way I think about ecology, there are, are really three major modules of processes that dictate the distribution and abundance of species. One of them is history and biogeography, which includes evolution, dispersal, all these various things. The second is the physical chemical environment the abiotic environment, which is fundamentally important to where species can live and where they do live. And the third is species interactions. And disease, really disease ecology, at least from my perspective, really uh, kind of fits into that third module. It has to do with the interactions of species. And, and so that's the nature of the kinds of things that we're talking about here. Most of us, when we think about disease, we think about human diseases or diseases to domesticated animals. And we really don't think about it so much from an ecological perspective, but the ecological perspective has just been massively growing in interest in the disease community and, and in the epidemiological community. So we are very fortunate to have four speakers in this class who are world leaders in this. and. Uh, our speaker today is uh, Professor Drew Harvell from, um, let me just, sorry, Drew, let me just minimize that. There we go. Uh, from Cornell University. She's actually here uh, in the South Bay down at Hopkins Marine Station on sabbatical. Drew, uh, I believe must have been a Canadian. I'm not absolutely, I don't know you well enough personally, but just judging from your, your <laughs> undergraduate record, she, she, she got her bachelor's and a master's degree from the University of Alberta and then moved to the University of Washington for a PhD. And she was at the University of Washington during the time that that was sort of the pinnacle of, of uh, of excellence in ecology, it really was. And not to say that it isn't still a wonderful place, but it was at that time, uh, that really the students that went in there, everybody wanted to go to the University of Washington. Everybody wanted to work in Bob Payne's lab or Peter Kariva's lab or one of the other really well-known people that were there at the university. And so Drew was part of that group. She immediately made a name for herself, uh, largely in the ecological realm went on to uh, Cornell, I, I think not long after that, and was there throughout her career. She's worked on a variety of things, but, but her interests and skills and, and reputation have really um, um, uh, you know, drifted into the realm of disease in the oceans. And she is, I would say, probably without question now, the world expert on that subject. I don't think there's anyone uh, that knows more about it than she does. And uh, I want to just a, a direct your attention to her recent book. It's, I'm not even sure if it's available yet. Uh, I looked online yesterday at the University of California Press and they have it forthcoming, I think in January. So it is either now just available or will soon be, com be coming out. And so um, uh, obviously this is something that will be of great interest to those of you that are interested in her lecture today. So I think with that, I will turn the screen share over to her. I wanna thank her again, and I'll thank her again at the, at, at the end for giving this lecture. And Drew, why don't you uh, have at it? Huh? We're, we're really looking forward to, to what you have to tell us today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Jim. I'm, I'm hoping everybody can hear me. I'm now unmuted. I really appreciate that kind introduction and really kind of our shared history with the whole group of marine species interactions that, that, that did have certainly a center of gravity at the University of Washington. Um, and the book is out uh, and it's easily available through actually Amazon um, in either Audible, which I'm quite proud of the Audible version. It's, it turned out really well because I got such a great narrator. Um, <laughs> and I, what you saw was there's a forthcoming paperback, but the hardcover is available. And let me just uh, get my screen share organized here. 
And then we will start. All right, can everybody see my screen? Yes, it's it's up and okay. It just just fine. great. Let me get rid of the settings. We don't need that. Um, I'm going to minimize some of you so I can see my slides. Okay. Um, well, again, thank you so much, Jim. Actually, I'm really impressed that you chose this topic. I think it's obviously very timely, and it's a it's a teachable moment, in my view, for the world really to think about infectious disease kind of at a broader broader level, and so. It is really timely that you've done this and populated it with some other really exciting speakers. Um, I talked to Felicia uh, after her talk last week, got a few um, comments from her. She really enjoyed the session and found the group to be incredibly engaging. So what I wanna talk about are ocean pandemics from what we call foundation to keystone species. And foundation species are things like seagrasses and corals. They're the things that create habitats in nature. And then keystone species are strong interactors, things like starfish, or in Jim's case, uh, sea otters. Um, oops, I think I better turn my phone off here. Forgot to, excuse me, just a second. There we go. Um, and this will be, this is partly uh, the same ground I covered in this Rachel Carson lecture. Sorry, I'm having a little trouble with my phone. It seems to really want to be heard. There we go. So Felicia last week talked about where does ecology fit into interactions by host and pathogen. And of course, Jim mentioned that. And I think she showed this slide. She was talking more about um, pathogens that affect critters on land. And of course, I'm going to be moving into the ocean. But many of the questions and approaches are the same. Uh, the kinds of work that we do in my lab is to study the ecology of host pathogen interactions. And I think of them, especially in the ocean, as sentinels of change in some of our ecological interactions. And so, for example, uh, I'm showing you this, this Venn diagram, which kind of shows the groundwork of how, how we view these interactions where we study hosts, pathogens in their environment. And the kinds of hosts I'll be talking about are um, corals, seagrasses and sea stars. And in my Venn diagram, the environment is red. And the reason for that is that a lot of the work that we do uh, are diseases that are actually triggered by the interaction of these three components of the Venn diagram in a warming ocean. Uh, and then one, hmm, just one comment about terminology. If you've ever thought any of you, you know, about what, what is the definition of a pandemic? It's an epidemic that's occurring worldwide or over a very wide area crossing international boundaries. And so we normally think of anything that's crossing continental scale locations as a pandemic. So in that sense, any one of these that I'm talking about would be a pandemic. Um, and then just a comment about the book, climate change, can act directly and through biological interactions such as disease to unravel ocean ecosystems. And the examples and theme really of my book is, is about that. But also it's broader than that. I talk about some of the advent, well, a lot of the adventures we've had around the world studying um, disease outbreaks and the detective work to kind of get to try to get to the bottom of the causes of them. There's a lot of science that underpins this work. And these are some of the prominent papers that came out of a National Science Foundation six year project that I was the uh, late lead investigator for. And in virtually all of these cases, again, it's documenting the effects of a warming, warming climate on infectious disease for marine organisms. So I just wanna kind of point out there's a lot of, a lot of foundation material um, most of which I'm not going to take you through. Um, and so today, this is these are the three main issues I want to talk about. I'll give some background information 
about some of these infectious epidem epidemics that occur in the ocean and how they increase with warming. Um, I'm gonna focus a lot on the work that we're doing in eelgrass meadows because we're able to study this on what I would call a continental scale from San Diego to Alaska. Uh, and it's some of the best disease ecology that we've been able to do in the ocean. Um, and then lest we all get too depressed about everything that's besetting us, including this new problem in the ocean, um, there's some ways forward. And I wanna end by talking about ecosystem services to improve ocean health. And if my, my time, if I start to go over, Jim, because I get excited and I forget to stop, don't hesitate to say, hey, we should take a break now. So um, this is a paper that we published a few years ago, led by then postdoc in my lab. And I just like to show it because it's a picture. We reviewed all of the cases where marine organisms are affected, not just by an infectious disease, but one that tends to increase with warming waters. And you can see there's quite a few examples, including things you know well here on the California coast, of course, our stars, and I'll be coming to that. Uh, abalone, I can't talk about, although I write a fair bit about it in the book because I think it's an exciting case and it's definitely a warming ocean story. But there's also things like uh, oysters, corals, and lobster. And the example that we talk about, we actually make forecast predictions about how the disease of lobsters will get worse from um, from Long Island up into Maine uh, with warming waters. And so kind of showing the value of understanding quantita quantitatively the link between critters getting sick and how warm the ocean gets, because then we can predict things. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time taking you through quantitative numbers, but this is a really important one. And it's one that you've been hearing about because we've been talking about it with regard to COVID. And so this is, uh, what we call r naught, or the basic reproductive number of an infection. And I bet you it's possible that Felicia talked about it last week. So I'm going to just really do a general take on it, but um, verbally what r naught means, it's the average number of new cases generated from each infected individual over the course of an infection. Um, so if you just added one infected person, <laughs> how many uh, new cases uh, would emerge from that. We call those secondary cases. And so here's just some numbers. And boy, I just wanna emphasize this word average. And I know that some of you are thinking about that, right? For COVID, for example, the r naught depends critically on context, right? Whether a person's gonna spread it a lot or not depends on whether they're masked or not and how the other people around them are behaving. Anyway, these are averages like, an, like a population average. Measles is super infectious, uh, a huge r naught of 12 to 18. Something like Ebola, which terrifying though it is, has a relatively much lower um, uh, transmission rate. Uh, the coronavirus worldwide has been estimated to be between two and four. And again, it totally depends on what country you're in, what state you're in, where you are, and how people behave. Um, some of you are hearing about the new UK variant. This one has me deeply worried and we can talk about that later just because it has such a much higher transmission rate. And I don't know the r not we don't know it yet, but it's definitely 50 to 70% higher. So this is worrisome. And then uh, we're gonna try to estimate it for our eelgrass wasting disease, but we think it's pretty infectious. Um, and I'll come back to that. So we use this number for example, this is the most complicated figure that I'm gonna show and I'll just walk you through it. This is from a paper we had actually a long time ago in 2002, talking about the links between climate warming and infectious disease. So this is time uh, running across this X axis. And then this is temperature going from 13 degrees up to 20. And let, just look at the blue line for a minute. So this is, uh, this is the R naught. And as we go through the summer season, the temperatures go up. And so the R naught in a temperature sensitive disease would increase the number of cases that each individual spreads would increase with temperature. And, and we've been able to document this, but then the temperature goes back down and you get below this severe disease line and then everything's okay for a while again. Um, 
However, with warming, we're shifting this line upward. Uh, and this is just even showing, uh, I think, a two, is it two, de two degree uh, warming here. You can see that even in the, uh, a larger part of the season, you're above the severe disease line where your r naughts might be three or four. Um, and you're reaching this epidemic disease temperature. So that's kind of the picture of how our very standard epidemiological measure of disease outbreak could relate with temperature. And in fact, we see this in a number of cases. Um, so a lot of the work that we've done uh, over the last six years in our network is to try to understand a bigger picture in the ocean of what kinds of infectious diseases are in the ocean and how big an impact they cause. One of the biggest questions we get asked again and again, particularly with corals, is um, are these diseases increasing through time? It's a hard question, as Jim knows. I've talked to him about this. Um, we've discussed it. It's a hard question because we don't have actual baselines. So what we attempted to do, and this was led by a very brilliant PhD student of mine, um, Allison Tracy, across all of these marine critters from fish to turtles to mammals to corals um, to figure out over a 40 year period, what percentage of their, the literature is about disease. And you can see that over that 40 year period, let's just look at corals, um, you know, it's less than 2%. So only two out of 100 studies might be about infectious disease averaged over that whole period. There's a lot more for fish. Um, but what we wanted to do was to use the baselines to look through time at how these things increased. And so this plot um, from 1970 to 2000, I think it's 15, shows uh, the disease reports for corals uh, through time. So then you can unpack that 2% number and see that actually it's increased to the point where in some years it's over 15%. Um, uh, in these peak years. And because we have such good data for uh, temperature, exactly GIS matched to the disease reports, we can show there's a correlation between warming and uh, the disease reports in corals. So this is just one example of trying to take a broader, broader view of this. I could talk the whole time about coral disease. We've worked a bit on it. It's an increasing problem worldwide. Uh, and it's in addition to bleaching, which you've undoubtedly heard about, bleaching is caused by heat stress alone. It's not an infectious disease, but it does lead to infectious disease because these corals become stressed and more susceptible. And so here's just one example of this, what started as a mysterious coral outbreak it's spread now Caribbean wide. It's extremely damaging. That white skeleton on the coral is where it's died. And um, because it's so bright white, it means it's died very fast. And this is the only living tissue left. And it, the rest of this would die within a couple of weeks. Um, and so there's been a lot of attention to that, including questions about you know, where the disease comes and how it spreads. So. Um, that's kind of just a placeholder for coral disease being an important part of this. And <laughs> I don't know, this isn't exactly funny, but it's kind of interesting. This is a, a, a little uh, comic that uh, a close colleague of mine, Sasha Seeroy, does these for all kinds of marine processes to kind of spread awareness. So the Brito star says, okay, who's next? How are you all feeling talking to these different species of corals? And this one uh, says, I think I have a rash, a purple rash, and there's a disease that causes purple rashes. This one has got a bleaching problem. It says, is it just me or is it hot in here? This one's not speaking up at all. And then this one, this little mounding coral um, says it feels like a pile of shit. And so um, it's just a way to kind of help spread awareness about this. I want to move now and talk about a topic that's probably familiar to most of you if you've spent much time on our incredibly beautiful marine habitats near here, and that's the sea star outbreaks called wasting, caused by wasting disease. Uh, 
a few general points first. It's the largest marine wildlife epizootic, panzootic. Um, it started in 2013, between 2013 and 15, depending where you were. And, and less well known is that it continues on the West Coast, and I'll come back to that. Uh, it's the largest marine epidemic because so many species were affected over such a wide geographic range, not just on our continent, not just the West Coast, but also the East Coast and also Asia. And at least 20 sea star species were affected. And of course, you know, they're ecologically important and there's a climate link. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about this. We worked on this at the very beginning and then you're really lucky because it's not gonna just be me telling you about it. This is a, a really nice video abstract of a paper we published last year entitled Disease Epidemic and a Marine Heat Wave are Associated with the Continental Scale Collapse of the Sunflower Star. And so it kind of gives the background and I, I think it's fun to listen to. So I hope you like this for about three minutes. There's an epidemic in the ocean. Since 2013, a viral disease has been turning sea stars in the Northeast Pacific into melted piles of goo. Of the 20 or so species of sea stars affected by the virus, one of the hardest hit were sunflower stars. Until now, we haven't known just how bad the decline was, but new research has begun to reveal the longer term continental scale impact of the epidemic on certain species. Scientists in the U.S. are now suggesting we formally list the once common sunflower star as an endangered species. Trained citizen science divers from California to Alaska counted sunflower stars on over 11,000 dives, while scientific divers from the Hakai Institute carried out more detailed surveys on the BC Central Coast. When they looked at all the data, scientists noticed something in common where they saw outbreaks of the virus, anomalously warm water. We still don't know how these warm water anomalies and the virus interact, but researchers say these warmer than normal water temperatures were related to dramatic sea star declines. While divers can patrol waters near the surface, we didn't know whether sunflower sea stars might have found refuge at deeper depths. But thousands of NOAA bottom trawl surveys have revealed that when it comes to sunflower stars, the disease didn't stay in the shallows. For example, Data from Washington State shows a crash in populations in both shallow nearshore and deep offshore environments after the epidemic began in 2013. Data from other areas on the coast are similar, with population declines of as much as 80 to 100% in areas across the 3,000 kilometers from Alaska to California. Sea stars may appear to be the passive bottom dwellers of the deep blue, but they're Okay, I'm going to stop that just because time is time is moving on and I want to keep on time and be respectful of that. So that was a paper that we published last year and I just want to point out some of the some of the underlying uh, consequences of this. This is uh, some older data now from Reef Check California, but I thought it'd be interesting to show the California data and they were kind enough uh, to share this with me. Um, and that paper that we wrote part, was partly based on citizen science data. And I don't know if any of you do citizen science work, but of course it was enormously valuable in this case. So for example, uh, the citizen science data for the sunflower star goes back to 2007. So it gives us a little bit of a baseline of the normal numbers for these animals before the dramatic basically to zero in California. Uh, and then a consequence is that urchins are increasing and um, along with perhaps other things causing massive declines in um, kelp beds. And so we're continuing this work. Um, so just as an update, the Pycnopodia are currently rare. They're almost absent in California. Uh, we've now been able to list them with the International Union of Conservation uh, Network as imperiled. Um, other species are still experiencing mortality events. Um, there's some good news. There's some exciting good news in science and that some species have a degree of resistance uh, like the Pisaster we think. And there's a lot of uncertainty about the nature of the causative virus. And I'll come back to that in just a second because Felicia last week talked about uh, how you decide if a species is a host for a particular pathogen. And, 
And she said you could test a sample of its blood to get the genetic, see if the genetic sequence was there. You could test a sample for antibodies. You could um, measure how much it actually transmits uh, going forward. However, to do any of these things, you need to know what it is. And this is the problem. Uh, so this is the experiment that we did in 2013 with the sunflower star. Um, uh, uh, a filtrate was made from uh, an infected star. Uh, the control part of it was heat killed, so it had no live virus in it. Um, 0.2 micron is, is about the, the uh, size for viruses. So anything that was in that filtrate is likely viral. Uh, and then the active, um, the active fil filtrate was injected into stars. Uh, the results of two runs through this was that only these ones injected with the active filtrate and virtually all of them developed lesions and died. And so that's the evidence that uh, a virus sized fraction uh, is involved in some of this mortality, maybe all of it. Uh, since then, there's not been a lot of progress on infectious agents. Um, and so it remains a big question. There's a new paper out. Some of you may have seen um, uh, some of the news reports about uh, starfish drowning in the ocean. Uh, what this paper describes is what we call um, um, dysbiosis uh, uh, associated with low oxygen in lab studies. And so it's not, it's not an explanation for this continental scale, pandemic scale mass mortality, but perhaps an ex explanation for what happens when you bring these stressed infected animals in and expose them to low oxygen. Um, and so we're working with a group on a Pycnopodia recovery plan, including captive breeding. Um, <laughs> I really love Rachel Carson. It was fun to do this Rachel Carson lecture because I went back and read a couple of her books. And so I'm just giving you a few of her quotes. Um, I love this one. Nature has introduced great variety into the landscape, but man has displayed a passion for simplifying it and thus undoes the checks and balances by which nature holds the species within bounds. We don't really know what the checks and balances are normally with, with the disease outbreak of this kind, but, but certainly some of the changes in our oceans may be responsible for it, it being a more big impact. So I'm not actually doing formal polling because we didn't, couldn't quite figure out how to do that, but I wanna kind of take a little brief pause here and just ask you to think a little bit about what I've told you. And you don't have to give the answers, we can talk about these later, but um, of all the species that we're affecting, why is it that the sunflower star is the one that's now imperiled, uh, that's considered at risk for extinction along across its range? Um, is it because its habitat puts it more at risk? The fact that it was living subtitally deep waters as opposed to something like the Pisaster, which is on the inner tidal? Is it eating a different food that puts it more at risk? Or is it the most susceptible to a disease agent uh, that can affect multiple species? And so it probably wouldn't surprise you that although we don't know the answer actually to any of these questions that uh, I would kind of vote for number three, uh, we certainly <coughs> know that this is a multi-host pathogen um, and uh, our evidence was that the sunflower star was always the most susceptible. And this is also something that's been played out, for example, with um, Hawaiian birds and avian malaria. Again, there are species driven to extinction um, uh, that are the most susceptible. So I'm gonna move on. So um, I hope we're not quite at a stopping point. I'd like to say a little bit more before we take a break, um, but I'm gonna switch gears and I wanna talk about the work we're doing in eelgrass meadows. And <clears throat> the reason I like to talk about this is not just because it's so ecologically important, um, but as a disease ecology, project, it's uh, much more satisfying than the sea star wasting one because we have an infectious agent and um, can do some really solid science with that. So I wanna take you through some of this. And then the other piece is that I'll come back at the end and talk about kind of the irony that although 
uh, this ecosystem has real benefits for reducing disease. It itself is affected by uh, a pretty destructive disease. And we call it a keystone pathogen. It's uh, identified, it has a name, it's Labyrinthula zostri, and I'll tell you how we know that and how prevalent it is in nature. And then some of our new tools of using artificial intelligence <clears throat> approaches to being able to scale up our monitoring and do true continental wide uh, surveys. This is what it looks like. So um, this is the Labyrinthula zostri. These are the little cells, spindle shaped cells that move in mucus networks inside the tissue of the plants. And uh, we're able, uh, we have, I think, excellent diagnostics in this case of what causes these kinds of lesions um, because we can culture it. Uh, even my undergrads can take a, <clears throat> a plant with lesions and, and culture it. Uh, we can do histology to show what the cells look like and we can do uh, molecular tests. And so this is um, what we've been faced with for such a long time. Here's our plants. How do we decide? Is this one sick or is this one sick? Or what about this? And so we've spent almost a decade uh, working on that problem and we're pretty confident now that we can call them. So this is the uh, molecular validation showing we can actually count how many cells would be an infected section of plant. So these kinds of lesions that are dark and run along the plant like that have very high cell counts. The ones where there's already necrosis and whitening in the, in the, um, the lesion are older and they have much lower cell counts including these where the plant has, has already died, there's very little of the disease agent left in those. And there's nothing in this because it's just desiccation stress. And fortunately, there's nothing in this because this is a healthy, um, a healthy plant. So that's kind of how we make these determinations. Um, we take this really seriously to be sure we have it nailed down. This is a beautiful experiment that um, um, two of my graduate students did where they actually inoculated healthy plants with the culture and then looked at what happened through time. And so I don't remember what the numbers are, but they were big. There were 15 or 20 plants in the treatments and 15 or 20 in the controls. And what you can see is the controls are basically zero. So they didn't get sick, which is good because they weren't infected with the pathogen but the diseased ones did. And after two days, um, the size of the lesions grew through time. And um, oh, just to show you what it looks like, here's one on day five. So here's the lesion starting and here's how it grows through time. Same thing here. And then here's the qPCR work, which is really quite lovely, um, showing just the increase in cell counts through time. Um, uh, one day uh, experimental, the two day, once you start to see the lesions, you've got up to almost 8,000 cells, zero in the controls uh, and all the way through. So this is sort of how we know. The other question that we're really concerned about, and it's a huge black box in the ocean. It's also hard to get a handle on, on land, but it's even worse under the sea, is uh, how this is spreading. And so to do that, we did a field experiment. And here I am with our, with our undergrad putting these blocks out that have plants um, growing on them. Those plants were all clean when we put them out. They had no disease, we call them sentinels. And the amazing thing is that, well, the question was, will they pick up more infections if we put them inside an eelgrass bed or if we put them close by the eelgrass bed or if we put them like really far, uh, 400 meters from the eelgrass bed. And the result was pretty surprising. We had expected that these would have the most, then these, and then very few on these far ones. However, what we found out, and we ran this thing three times in three different habitats, and this is just the last run because it was the best. Um, this showed uh, roughly 60% of the plants inside the bed developed lesions. Uh, over 60% uh, near the bed, 
And then here was the surprising one. These far 400 meters from the bed also developed high numbers. So this means this uh, disease agent is, is highly infectious and highly waterborne. And we controlled this by keeping um, plants in the lab that didn't get infections. Um, I'm gonna kind of skip over this a little because I think we might be getting close to the time that we're gonna break. But one of the things we're interested in, of course, is the temperature sensitivity. And so we've been monitoring our eelgrass beds um, uh, since 2012, including through the blob or the warm, the warm heat wave in 2015 and 16. And what we found is, I'm gonna, uh, okay, never mind. Uh, what we found is that we're having increasing levels of disease up to 90 or 100 percent of the plants in our beds sometimes have lesions on them. Uh, and then it's been increasing through time. And so if you look at 2015, this is what shows that it's actually uh, one of the predictions for what the levels would be in the following summer is what was the winter temperature. If you have a warm winter that precedes a warm summer, the levels of disease are much higher than if you'd had a cool winter. And this suggests that there's something about the overwintering biology uh, of the disease that's affected. Um, and so this, this is a big priority for us to try to figure out what's going on uh, in, those win in this winter warming. And this just shows if there's winter days below eight degrees, the purple here is cold, then the predicted disease risk is very low in May and in um, uh, the summer. Whereas if you have uh, no winter days below eight, the predicted disease risk is really high. Um, so um, I want to go ahead. So what we've shown kind of the center of gravity of our work is the San Juan Islands uh, and Puget Sound. And we've shown big levels of outbreaks. And that led us to say, well, this species is distributed from San Diego to Alaska. What does it look like on the rest of its range? In order to do that, we had to develop this artificial intelligence um, um, program. It's called image segmentation machine learning. And it, it doesn't really look like much. So here's, here's what our plants look like. Obviously these have infections and the program picks up and marks them in red. But it took two years to train this program to be able to do this. It's not just image analyzing these, it actually has a fairly complicated recognition process that we've, we've trained into it and then um, tested it. Uh, and um, it tests very well against humans. So it basically is doing as well as our trained humans. And this is important because if we have 10 humans, they actually show more variation in their judgments about disease levels than this, than this program does. Uh, and so we were able to use the ELISA to do a much broader survey. So Alaska, British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, um, Bodega Bay and San Diego um, to look at how uh, the levels of disease varied across this entire range. And these are our sites. And this work is led uh, at the analysis by Lillian Aoki, our postdoc. And um, the cool thing about this, well, the surprising thing was that our Washington sites are among the highest. This was not my judgment. I didn't score these, ELISA scored them, um, although they were checked. And so we in fact do have high levels of disease. Um, and then the other thing that's really important is that this kind of analysis allows us to test temperature across a, across a wide range. And what we're seeing is that the sites that have anomalously warm temperatures have a higher level of disease. So um, we knew this from lab studies, but it's been important and from our uh, San Juan Island work, but it was important to nail this down um, on a wider scale. So I'm about getting to the point where we might take a break but I thought before we do that, I wanted to just share some of the points I've made because I, I know I did go through this kind of fast um, about our eelgrass wasting disease. And so again, we don't have to pull on this, 
Um, but I'd like you to look at what I, the kinds of conclusions that I'm making and think about which of these is most interesting to you. And that might be something we could talk about. So I showed you that um, our molecular test called the qPCR uh, and culture allow us to do quantitative inoculation experiments. So we can actually show how the disease develops on a plant. Um, I also showed you that our artificial intelligence machine language learning lesion recognition allows continental scale um, surveys. Um, I showed a little bit about how field and I didn't show you the lab infections increase with warming temperatures, but we have pretty good data on that. Uh, and then the fact that we have this actually surprisingly wide scale waterborne transmission. So um, so those are kind of the conclusions from, from what I've talked about. And I don't know, Jim, it's kind of up to you if you think this is the point at which it's good to take a little bit of a break or should I launch into part three of, uh, of my talk now? I think this is a, a good time to take a break. Why don't we take uh, 10 minutes and people can uh, relax. Well, you can unmute if you like and talk to one another or if Drew's still on ask her questions during that period of time. And then uh, my phone says exactly 1045. So let's begin at exactly 1055, okay? Um, and uh, yeah, let's, let's do that. That sounds like a good plan. Hey, Drew, this is Dan Costa. Great, great talk so far. I, I'm kind of curious if you have, I mean, it's clear the temperature is important and I certainly, see that and would certainly, I would not argue against temperature, but temperature also can reflect uh, water, water mass properties. I either that there's no current that the water is stagnating or that you have a different source of water so that you, you could have different currents bringing in a greater or lesser degree of bringing uh, the, the, uh, the vector. Is there, do you have anything that to address that, I mean, it, I would argue that would certainly be an addition to temperature, but it could also be correlated with temperature. Yeah. Oh, that's a great question, Dan. And the answer is um, yes. We're trying to get to the bottom of it. Uh, in the you know, lab experiments are nice because we can we can look at different factors. Uh, at the same time. So for example, we know that salinity is really important. In fact, in the lab, if we use low salinity conditions, it actually uh, knocks back the infections. And so in our sentinel experiments, we keep them overnight under low salinity for that reason. So yes, and you could expect temperature and salinity uh, would obviously could co-occur under some conditions. Uh, we also think that probably eutrophic high organic matter conditions um, also probably stress the plants and predispose them and perhaps also transmit higher levels. So we, we certainly wouldn't rule that out. Across all those things though, temperature has been, has been the most consistent. Um, and, um, but I think it's gonna be exciting to try to partition out some of those things. One of my grad students, Olivia Graham is actually working on a bigger data set that uh, where she's, attempting to pull out some of those other factors. Yeah, it's a great question. Cool, I, I figure you'd probably have that, especially with the people you work with, you'd have that in the back pocket. Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's tricky. We don't wanna, I don't wanna oversimplify this and make it seem as if it's just all temperature. Um, and yet we do think the temperature is sort of the overriding factor, um, but it's gonna be very important to check and see how these other factors synergize. Uh, with temperature, yeah. Drew, I have a question. Um, basically, something that has emerged because I've been I've been diving along this coast for decades, and uh, during probably about the mid '80s, I don't remember the exact time now. I'd have to go back and look, but there was another asteroid wasting disease. Uh, it it extended at least from the Gulf of California, so there were mass die-offs of Heliaster, and then up along our coast, at least to Central California, I don't know how far north it went, but virtually all the stars just disappeared. And I remember seeing them just 
waste away in these little piles of spicules, just like the pictures you showed of Pycnos. And I wonder, is there any sense if that was the same or a different disease? I realize that, uh, I'm sure you're aware of it, uh, and, and I don't know what, but that disease ended very abruptly. And all of a sudden, there were stars back in the kelp forest at Hopkins, uh, you know, a year or two later, and it looked just like it did before. And so I'm, I'm, I, I'm wondering, one, do you have any sense of whether that was a similar disease, the same disease, or a different disease? And what's your thought? I realize this is just, this is just kind of, um, there's no way of really knowing, but is, is there any possibility or likelihood that this is going to end again, that it's going to abruptly end like that one seems to have ended? Yeah, that's a lot of questions all at once, but they're all good ones. Uh, the heliaster was impressive. Uh, and as far as I know, the heliaster has not come back. Um, that's kind of been a sort of a surprising part of that, um, unless you know differently, but in the southern part of its range. Um, and other than um, most of the earlier wasting disease events tended to only affect one species at a time, as far as I know. Um, whereas the 2013 one was pretty surprising in that it just took out such a big swath of them. Um, but like you said, uh, for example, our inner tidal star, the, the ochre star that probably everybody knows um, seems to be making some recovery, at least in our water. Um, they're about, they were knocked back 70% and they're still, you know, well, well under 50% of what they were, but they're still surviving. And, and I, we're feeling kind of optimistic they will come back. And some of the others have certainly um, are, are showing better numbers. Uh, so in that sense, um, you know, maybe it's a little bit like what you described. But the Pycnopodia are not coming back. And we've waited, you know, we've written three or four papers before that one and before proceeding to this IUCN listing. We kind of waited and waited and waited, but here it is 2021 and they're still not back. And that was uh, over eight years ago. And so kind of a long time. And there's still observations that where they are occurring in the more Northern part of the range, they periodically are still dying. So I don't know what to say about whether this is gonna go away. I mean, I'm hoping that the natural order of things are that some of these species are developing resistance, um, but we do know that multi-host pathogens can be dangerous. Um, in the case of the Hawaiian birds, uh, there's multiple species did go extinct and didn't come back. Uh, in the case of um, Amphibian chytrid fungus, same thing. It's a multi-host pathogen. It's taken out a lot of species, like hundreds of frogs. So, you know, I don't know what to say. We, we, it's kind of like COVID, right? <laughs> We're just kind of watching to see what happens. Um, and I don't think, I don't think we know. Um, we're actually about ready to launch some newer experiments to try once again, to get better information about what the infectious agent is. You know, I saw you. I know you've been interacting some with Jenny Eckert. Um, I've, I'm involved with the project where we're doing some sampling, still doing some sampling from some long-term sites in Southeast Alaska, uh, around Sitka and up in that area. And I, I the the group that was up there last year um, saw what they what they thought were some recovering picnopodia. Now I don't know exactly what that what that meant. Jenny, Jenny might probably would know better than anyone just since she's up there and is connected to all these things. Or Christy Croker, I think you probably know Christy who's here. Uh, Christy actually has been leading that work with some undergraduates, but they, they seem to, uh, you know, the, the reports that I heard were that they were seeing some, some large Pycnopodia there where they hadn't seen them the year previous, which would indicate that maybe there is some recovery going on in that area. But, but I don't, I'm yeah. not aware of any others. We'd love to see it. I mean, we have, we have this kind of big Pycnopodia recovery team that's based at the Seattle Aquarium that involves several Alaskan scientists up to Ketchumak Bay. Um, and uh, it's very spotty. There are some places, and there's some places in BC uh, tucked way up in the 
um, the really cold, low salinity fjords that seem to be slight refuges for them. So yeah, they do show up from time to time, but um, it pretty low, pretty low. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it's amazing. I mean, I, I, anyone that's worked up in Southeast Alaska in particular knows how abundant sunflower stars were. I mean, they were just everywhere. I've never seen anything like it. And now they're just gone. I mean, it is astonishing, really. Yeah, it just... was astonishing, yeah. Okay, so we are at uh, 10.55. I think it'd be a good time to, to get going again. That's what we had planned. And uh, so I'm gonna ask everyone if you would again, mute your, your, uh, your, your microphones and, uh, and, and X out your videos so that, because we've had, it's been great, the, the, the signal has been good. I mean, there hasn't, it hasn't been weak at all. So it's, it's working really well. So we'll, we'll do that and you can finish up and then we'll use whatever time after you're finished with your presentation for Q and A and discussion. I'm sure there'll be people that will, that will wanna ask questions. So let's uh, go ahead with that, all right? Yeah, that's great. Um, and thanks everybody. You know, I forgot to congratulate you all for even just being here. <laughs> I mean, we're having a pretty pretty crazy week uh, in terms of our country and what's going on. And it's extremely distracting um, between the levels of COVID and the danger from COVID and uh, the danger to, to our democracy. So uh, for me, I don't want to say this is my happy place studying disease, but science and uh, working on the science issues certainly is. And, and I like to think about this. This is a sort of a new direction. Uh, and I, I, think, I think this is important to think about. And so um, I'm going to call this part three of my talk or ecosystem services for pathogen reduction. Um, scientists like me and Jim talk about ecosystem services. They're the things that a natural ecosystem does that are helpful to humans. Um, and so, for example, probably one of the best examples is the New York City watershed. Uh, instead of, you know, damming a bunch more rivers and putting in a really complicated, expensive water filtration plant, um, they use the natural ecosystem services of clean waters in the mountains. Um, and so that, that would be an example of an ecosystem service. Um, the one I'm talking about here is one that Science Magazine called marine hygiene. They actually named this thing. I didn't uh, in our article. And our article was about pathogenic bacteria being reduced by 50% in Indonesian seagrass beds. And this was part of a long-term study work that we've been doing in Indonesia. But this part of the study, I give the credit to um, my postdoc at the time, Jolie Lamb, and now I'm proud that she's a, she's a professor actually close by at Irvine. Um, and uh, she's the one that led the publication of this, of this paper. And um, I think it's one of the most exciting projects we've done. We worked in a place called Baring Lumpo Island and this kind of all got started when we were running um, coral health surveys. We were actually training, it was a workshop. We were training uh, Indonesian scientists on how to recognize disease and, and do these surveys. Well, then everybody got sick. And so it was a little bit of a joke, like here the coral disease health people are here and now everybody's sick. And so, you know, what's going on? But of course we argued that what's going on is that some of the things that are making um, you know, human sick are maybe also making coral sick. And so we saw it as an opportunity um, uh, to kind of create that linkage between human health and uh, environmental health. And so our hypothesis was that in some locations uh, in the seagrasses, uh, there were fewer pathogens. And so what you can see, if you just look at the pink boxes, for some reason, my cursor is not coming up. That's um, if you just look at the pink boxes here, you can see one of them says, uh, you're not, you're not on share screen. Oh, well, <clears throat> thanks for pointing that out. Um, all right, well, let's share screen. Maybe that'll help. <laughs> Sorry. 
Um, can you see my screen now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. How's that? Good. Okay. So this is that Barring Lumpo Island uh, where we were working. You can see there's a lot of people in houses and there's no septic. So it's not surprising we got sick. Here's the pink boxes. So we, uh, these are little culture dishes for Entrococcus, which is an indicator bacterium. In fact, it's the one used in the US to decide whether there's a unlawful level of sewage in waters. In places where there was no seagrass, there's lots of little red dots. Uh, and that means there's lots of the Entrococcus. And in places where the seagrass is present, there's very few of those little dots. Um, and then here's the quantification of that. So we ran these at shore, well, right where the water was. So where the, basically the fecal matter was coming in, in the seagrass beds and then out on the reef that's just seaward of that. And this was replicated over four different islands. And what you can see here is that the levels are as high close to land, whether there's seagrass or not. But once you get to the seagrass beds, there's a dramatic, um, much bigger decline in the levels to, ver to half the levels you find. Um, and it stays low to the reef. So um, I'm just showing you the tip of the iceberg of this because uh, Joe Lee went back and did complete bacterial sequencing, detected really high levels of um, pathogens that are pathogenic to humans in these samples and in these samples. But again, lower levels for all of those bacteria uh, in the seagrass. And so um, she then went on to survey the health of the corals uh, and found that corals that were living in the edges or inside these seagrass beds had much lower levels of black band and white syndrome disease, which were the most common of the coral diseases. And so this was kind of the first study to link um, uh, the potentially cleansing powers or detoxifying powers of a seagrass bed for both humans and perhaps uh, for our biota um, like corals. And so this is in my view, kind of the beginning. Uh, it was a really good beginning. And so we're really interested to pursue this hypothesis, but in, uh, in domestic waters and um, pathogen overruns are also a serious problem in places like Seattle probably places like Santa Cruz at certain times of the year. Um, we call them tiny monsters or bacteria, but there's kind of the headlines we get King County fined for sewer overflow violations. Um, and so we teamed up with the people that do Muscle Watch. They uh, use mussels as passive integrators of toxins in the water and they plant them all over around Seattle and Puget Sound in um, over 60 locations. And so uh, again, this was led by uh, Jolie Lamb, uh, still then as a postdoc in my lab, to sequence the bacteria inside these mussels that were inside the seagrass beds and outside. And um, for the first time, we showed some really bad stuff in Seattle's waters, things like Staphylococcus, Campylobacteria, and Entrococcus, things that would make people sick um, at certain times of year. Um, and that the levels, the diversity of these pathogens uh, at our highly urbanized sites were lower uh, inside the seagrass than outside the seagrass. These were actually paired um, and then we actually outplanted mussels inside and outside the seagrass. So this study, we're not done analyzing the data from this. I'm waiting actually daily to get the manuscript, um, but so far it's showing that in urbanized areas uh, in these seagrass meadows may reduce the levels or the levels of human pathogens are lower in mussel gills. Now, this is kind of the beginning of a study like this. We're not, you know, we don't wanna, claim that seagrass is doing all of this, but so far uh, it's, it's very um, supportive that you can have natural ecosystems that have natural abilities to detoxify pathogens. And um, it's not really surprising. We know, for example, that seagrasses, kelps, mangroves can reduce pollutants 
uh, in water naturally. So this is not really a very surprising result in that sense, but it's one that hasn't really been thought about from the perspective of how we can actually use these natural ecosystems and what their real value can be um, in terms of services, that they can actually have health benefits for humans. Um, and so um, just in the, in the context of this, I had a, well, the, the COVID outbreak has been something as a disease ecologist that I've watched every minute since last January because, because I just was amazed. We, we knew something like this was gonna happen, um, but then to actually see it roll out and to see it, to see it reach such unprecedented levels was not expected. So I wrote a op-ed for the New York Times um, just because I was kind of thinking about it nonstop. And so one of the things I said, well, the title of it was how starfish, snails, and salmon fight pandemics. I did not think of that title. <laughs> the, uh, the op editor at the New York Times came up with that. But over time, I've come to kind of like it um, uh, because at least it points out the value of looking in the oceans, understanding how processes work in the oceans um, to broaden our ability to deal with infectious disease. And so I said, one of my quotes is, now the world is seeing the deadly path cut by a terrestrial pandemic spread by a new coronavirus that has killed tens of thousands of people worldwide. Of course, this was in March that I wrote it. Now we've had over, over millions as it continues uh, its sweep. If anything good is to emerge from this, it will be in the quest to better understand pathogens, infectious agents and their hosts, to think about nature's best defenses. Let's really think about uh, what are some natural solutions um, uh, to disease outbreaks and maybe begin to apply these findings to engineer a safer world. And so that's kind of what that article was about. And I felt like um, Rachel Carson said something like that earlier. She said, here and there awareness is growing that man far from being the overlord of all creation is himself part of nature subject to the same cosmic forces that control all other life. Man's future welfare and probably even his survival depend upon his learning to live in harmony rather than combat with these forces. So um, I'm here making a pitch that we figure out um, how to take advantage of uh, some of the things nature's already figured out in terms of fighting um, disease uh, and living more in harmony with nature. And so that's why I wrote this book, <laughs> uh, Ocean Outbreak. Um, I have this little um, logo. This is our ecology of infectious marine disease. This is a research coordination network that was funded by the National Science Foundation. So this was a team of over 50 scientists that worked for six years uh, on different issues of infectious disease in the ocean. And so I kind of was drawing on our collective experience in, in writing this book um, and feeling that, that the story needed to be told. But I don't know if any of you are authors, if you've written books, but I know Jim has. Um, and it's hard to think about how to frame a story, how to tell a complicated story, especially a big one like this. All these little pictures here, these are all the organisms in our oceans that have been affected by disease outbreaks. Um, so it's a kind of an, an epic tale, but it's almost too big for anybody to want to hear the details about. So I was puzzling over how to deal with that. Plus, there's the fact that when these disease outbreaks happen, our food chains are disrupted, and certainly the Sea Star case is an example of that. Uh, species are endangered um, and can be brought to the brink of extinction. And again, the sea star example is a, is a case of that, but there's others, for example, uh, abalone. Um, and then there's the complication of so many causes, human and environmental causes. Uh, and then somehow you have to add, you know, the excitement, right? I mean, doing this work, these are all detective stories, doing this work is exciting. Um, there are adventures, there's amazing scientific innovation and discovery involved. So I was kind of just like in a, in a depression about how I was going to deal with all that. And then I read um, 
I don't know if any of you read uh, Michael Pollan's, um, oops, Michael Pollan's work uh, on uh, Botany of Desires, one of his books. Uh, and what he did in that book, he picked four plants to tell the whole story of how humans interact with plants on our planet. And uh, I realized, oh, I could pick a subset of the diseases and maybe simplify, but make this story a little bit more approachable. So these are the four I picked for this book. Um, of course, corals, because it really clearly shows the climate change um, driving a huge increase in these diseases. Um, sea stars because of the ecological importance and, and the being driven to endangerment. By the way, corals also, over well over a third of coral species are in danger of extinction as of 15 years ago, so I'm sure it's more now. Um, abalone because I think it's a really interesting case where uh, it took over 15 years to identify the rickettsial bacterium that was causing the withering syndrome of these abalone. And now it's gotten even more interesting in that there's a phage that affects that withering syndrome bacterium. And so, you know, again, it's nature responding uh, in a compensatory way and teaching us some new things. And then I included salmon because salmon viruses have been an enormous problem worldwide. And those are pandemics uh, in affecting our food. And I figured, well, if nobody cares about all the invertebrates I'm so fascinated with, um, at least they care about salmon. And so uh, I sort of really, the main take homes from this are that these infectious disease outbreaks are fueled, some of them, many of them by warming. They are threatening our biodiversity as well as our food from the sea. But uh, there's a lot more we can be doing to study uh, the special powers that natural marine, marine ecosystems have. And I talk about several of those examples in the book. And so, especially in the wake of this coronavirus pandemic, I think we need to put more effort into understanding host pathogen interactions in nature, natural solutions to epidemic control, and understanding the oceans have unusual value for expanding our op options just because of the diversity of microbial agents in the ocean uh, and the ways some of the very ancient life forms like corals uh, that have learned how to live uh, 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 in these ocean waters. And so I think there's a lot more for us to learn. And I think that's probably my final word. Let's just see what we have here. Yeah. Uh, I probably made it sound like I do all this single-handedly. I just go out and do everything. But, you know, it's these people. Uh, this is our group from about seven years ago studying both sea star wasting. They're geared up actually to go do the uh, eelgrass surveys here. These are a series of undergrads, grad students, and um, postdocs, all of whom are still working together on this. So that's something I'm really proud of is that um, it's been an amazing team that's stayed together. Uh, and then this is the National Science Foundation current team. Uh, project led by Emmett Duffy. Um, and this is Lillian Aoki, our postdoc working on that. And um, that's our ongoing work is to understand the eelgrass outbreak from San Diego to Alaska and how that plays out on a continental scale. So that's um, all of the disease oriented stuff I have. I'm gonna end on one more note here because I'm trying to keep you, I'm gonna try to cheer you up um, cause that is, that's some pretty grim stuff. And, and it's something that definitely weighs heavily on me is, is the threats to our ecosystems. But, um, this project reminds me, we have amazing riches still in our ocean. There is so much still in our biodiversity to value and protect. And, um, this is my first book, A Sea of Glass. Uh, I, in addition to my other work, I'm the curator of these Blaschka glass invertebrates. So these things are all um, in our collection and they're made of glass and they're exact replicas of particular species in the ocean. So this book is about going back and finding the living matches for these, um, the Blaschka glass that was made 160 years ago. Uh, there are over 800 different marine species shown in this. Um, and so this is one of 
one of our locals in Friday Harbor anyway, the, the swimming sea star Stomphia. It just gives, it shows you how good the match is between the glass and the living anemone. And so can leave you with a challenge of, you know, which one do you think is glass and which one is, which one is real? Um, I'll just tell you, Finn the dog knows, but that's because he read the book. <laughs> so that's all I have for now. I'd like to talk about any and all of this. Okay, well, thank you very much, Drew. That was fabulous. Uh, so interesting, obviously a very uh, relevant topic. Um, and I think what we will do is I could ask you now, all of you that would like to engage to go ahead and unmute um, and, uh, and open up your video and we can proceed with, with a discussion for you know a while now, we have a bit of time. So um, those of you that might like to, to ask questions or, or engage yourself in a discussion here, uh, please, please feel free to do that, all, all of you, okay? So yeah, go ahead and unmute if you would, please. And those of you that want to ask questions and let's go forward with it. And uh, maybe I will just start out. I have a question uh, that I'd like to ask you about the, the, the Indonesian work and the harmful bacteria and the impact of the seagrass. Do you have any idea what the mechanism of that is? Because the seagrasses are not absorbing, they're not consuming these things. So there must be some, you know, obviously some mechanistic process whereby living the environment in that seagrass bed is less suitable to these, to these organisms, or maybe there's some other consumer that's facilitated by the seagrass or whatever, but you know what's going on there. Yeah, that's a, th I'm so glad you asked that question, Jim. Uh, that is kind of the million dollar question. And it's, it's not something that we were able to get to the bottom of in that study. Um, Jolie's put a little bit of effort into that. Uh, basically, the short answer is we think there's, there's four processes that are important. And probably, maybe the most important is oxygen production. Um, uh, I mean, our, our normal septic and I'm not arguing we shouldn't have septic treatment plants. <laughs> we, we, we do need those. I'm just saying that there's a lot of problems with over, overflow and uh, we also need our natural ecosystems to mop that up. Um, but the production of oxygen by these plants is probably really big. Um, so our guess is that might be you know, half of it, uh, maybe more, um, but certainly there are a lot of uh, the thing about eelgrass meadows is they have very high biodiversity. There are a lot of sponges and clams and oysters and uh, sea squirts that live in those seagrass beds that are also busily filtering. And so Jolie did collect a bunch of uh, oyster samples from inside and outside some of those beds. And we don't have the results back from that, but you know, one hypothesis is that you know, the natural biota is helping to filter out some of those pathogens as well. Uh, thirdly, we think that just passive, you know, passive processes when water flows through a seagrass meadow, uh, things settle out, right? It slows the flow of water. Uh, and so, um, you know, just the passive process of being there probably contributes something. And then <laughs> there's one more, and this is one that we're actually putting quite a bit of effort into in our NSF project, and that's the role of the bacteria that live on the surface of the seagrass itself. It's called the microbiome. And of course, of course, all of us have a microbiome inside of us, well, actually on our skin too. Uh, and so uh, there are a lot of healthy, a lot of you know, good bacteria that live on the surface of seagrasses that could also be fighting uh, some of these pathogens. Um, and so that's kind of interesting to us to see how it operates. Um, and one kind of one example that kind of gave us the idea for that is a Japanese, a group of uh, Japanese scientists showed that there's a bacterium that lives on eelgrass that can slow the growth and sometimes kill harmful algal blooms. Um, and so that's one example of, you know, a microbiome constituent that does something similar. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'll leave I, it open I, to I, any other discussion and questions, please. Go right ahead. 
I, I had two questions. One, uh, straightforward, the pathogen of the eelgrass, is that a bacterium? Oh, I didn't, I'm sorry if I didn't clarify that. Um, it's a protozoan. Okay, I thought it looked like it had nuclei. Yeah. Yes, 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 it's a protozoan. And so it's a lot easier to work on than, well, some of the bacteria are pretty easy to work with, but it, it's much easier because it, it cultures quite readily, yeah. But it has tiny, uh, I showed you what it looked like in culture, what the so-called vegetative part looks like, but it has these tiny cells called zoospores. And we think that probably is the culprit for our uh, wider spread transmission, but that's still a question. Okay, and then my bigger question is, so in, in discussions of climate change, et cetera, one of the scary things is also always the idea of tipping points. Do you, so do you think some of these things that you're investigating could be really serious tipping points where we go off the deep end? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's one of the reasons why we're interested in doing this continental scale modeling is to see, um, see where some of those tipping points might be in particular locations uh, on our coast, because that's what I'm most concerned about. But in the 1930s, there was a massive outbreak uh, in eelgrass meadows. Of course, the causative agent wasn't well studied, but it's thought uh, that it was Labyrinthia zostri. Uh, and it decimated entire eelgrass beds. I mean, it took out really a large proportion of uh, eelgrass beds on both sides uh, of the Atlantic. And so that's the kind of thing I'm actually pretty concerned about. We've seen some of our locations, um, we've lost 90% of the, the, the eelgrass in some of our places. And so we definitely know it has the potential to do that. Um, and we don't, know in terms of the causes what all the tipping points are but I think that's a really good way to frame frame that question um, you know in the case of the sea star epidemic um, it's just that's been a very 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 tough frustrating one to study because because we don't have our hands on the causative infectious agent um, the temperature work to show those correlations um, you know took a lot of sort of correlations through time uh, and so really all we can say about the role of temperature in that case is that it, it facilitated perhaps an outbreak that was going to happen anyway, rather than necessarily caused it. Um, yeah. Other it's, questions? I see there's some here that are in, uh, the people are putting on the chat, but, but go ahead and, and, and pop in. Oh, sorry, I think I spoke over somebody that wanted to talk. So please go forward. Okay, thank you. Um, in Santa Cruz, here at Natural Bridges, a number of years ago, we noticed that the piezaster, you know, with the wasting disease was, was decimating the population. But then a couple of years later, we noticed that there were like little gray sea stars like we'd never seen before that were a little bit bigger than your thumbnail. And they were starting to be seen all over the tide pools. And now we don't see any of those, but we're starting to see some of the bigger ones. Does anybody have any thoughts about that? I'm not sure where to go to find out more information. Thanks. Yeah, that's a really good, um, a really good point. There's a beautiful paper, you probably know Pete Ramundi that uh, Melissa Miner and Pete published um, that show, uh, I think the level, the date is 2017 or 18. Um, but if you, if you, if you Google uh, Melissa Miner, you'll find it. Um, and she talks for, again, that's another case where there was really a beautiful job of coastwide monitoring done by the Marine group. Um, and they did observe those that we, what we would call a recruitment event um, of Pisaster, uh, you know, right after uh, the outbreak. And, and it, it created great hope at the time, but they just didn't make it. Um, and so, you know, they didn't turn into adults in most places. Um, and so the thought, and, and we did some experiments uh, in 2014, where we brought the little ones in alongside the adults. And we actually found that the small stars, the juveniles, you know, the ones you're talking about, they're like that, um, actually died faster. Um, and 
like with the adults, we could see lesions and follow sick ones through time. With the little ones, they just like they were just gone. And so, um, you know, when they when they got sick, they died. Uh, so what we infer from this is that that recruitment event, you know, most of them didn't make it, but maybe some of them did, right? We've seen um, a few stars coming back and, and the hope is that those are somehow resistant. Um, and there's some really exciting work being done um, on the California Pies Asters to examine the hypothesis that there could be some resistant ones coming back. And that would be, that would be really wonderful. Yeah, yeah. And the same thing with the Pycnopodia, the sunflower star, we did see there were a few recruitment events that people noticed with excitement. Oh good, they're coming back. And then they just never grew up. When they, when they got to be about this big, they just didn't make it. Yeah, yeah thanks for that question. Please, Gunter. You'll have to unmute. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, thank you very much for your very interesting uh, presentation here. Uh, I wonder, is there an, a process where your findings get channeled into a higher level of organizations like the uh, Marine World Associations? And does that go into politics and then and ultimately into environmental groups who make these biggest decisions. Yeah, well, I think uh, it's a new it's a new age, right? Uh, for the last four years, there hasn't been a lot of policy options uh, that looked like they were going to be moving forward. But I think we're going to see some, and so I guess there's a lot more hope um, that. Uh, that we can push a lot harder for the role of science in making decisions and in protecting our natural environments. I mean, the ocean particularly has been ravaged over the last four years and has had no new protections and has just had level after level taken away. And so yeah. uh, the hope is that we'll see some of that turning around um, and that there could be really int interest in pushing forward with documenting better some of the valuable ecosystem services in our oceans um, to, to produce more policy change. Um, exactly. Certainly there's a, there's a big push for marine protected areas. And um, I would argue that uh, there's an awful lot of value in those marine, marine protected areas that, that we haven't even documented or counted yet. Um, and sort of this seagrass example is just one case of it, yeah. Yeah, I think there's still many people who are blasé about uh, the environmental or climate change. And if this would be made more public, uh, that would help the course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, we're, we're happy to keep working on that. Yeah. Well, let, let, let me ask a slightly technical question. I, I'm a molecular biologist, <clears throat> very intrigued with the challenge of trying to find out what specific virus is infecting the sea stars. So, I mean, to me, you could get some clean tissue and sequence the whole thing and find it, but obviously it's more technically difficult than that. So why, why doesn't that work? <laughs> that is a very good question. Um, it should work. You know, in, in our initial paper, the 2014 paper, um, that was you know, a pretty big publication where we did those experiments that I showed you with the, with the heat killed um, <clears throat> viral fraction. There was, a there was a candidate virus suggested based on those kinds of studies, basically comparing uh, uh, the metagenomics of uh, healthy and sick individuals. Um, the, the virologist that worked on that no longer thinks that that candidate that was suggested called a denzovirus is the actual cause of the disease. <clears throat> and so think a little bit about COVID and think about the challenges that we're having now uh, with even just figuring out if somebody's infected or not. Um, 
even, even some of our diagnostic tests will come up negative for a person that's COVID positive. Similarly, a lot of people are running around with COVID and they're showing no signs at all. They're what we would call asymptomatic. And so that makes uh, that, kind of, um, that kind of comparison between symptomatic and asymptomatic very challenging. And so I would think the same thing is likely happening, for example, with our sea stars that uh, there could be a lot of asymptomatic ones that are still carriers of the causative agent. And then there are symptomatic ones uh, where maybe the causative agent has gone past the point where you can detect it, you know, and it's not there. And so I don't know if I'm making this sound really complicated, but it, it, it actually is really complicated. And the other example of this, and the, I love to tell this one, is the abalone. So think about the withering syndrome of the abalone. And I talk in my book about the story of Carolyn Friedman, who's a really talented disease pathologist. She was working for the state of California in the late 80s when they were trying to figure out why are all the abalone dying? Uh, is it temperature stress? Is it this? Is it that? And finally, they were like, it must be a disease, but what is it? And they, th they went through about three different things and they kept rejecting them. And finally, they found the right one, this rickettsiobacterium that's in the, in the stomachs of the um, abalone. And then they're like, but no, it can't be this because every abalone we look at has this thing in it and they're not sick you know, and only a few of them are dying. So it can't be this thing. Well, they eventually found out it was that thing. It was just a slow acting disease. And so the range of the pathogen was huge, but the range of the animals that were dying was much smaller. Um, for example, where they're exposed to warm temperatures. I don't know, that's an, an example. So I don't want to make it sound like scientists don't know what they're doing and it's too much problem. <laughs> you know, but, but honestly, these disease investigations are pretty tricky. Um, yeah. Yeah. But we're going to try again. Uh, we're going to do some more, of, uh, some more of those inoculation experiments farther north, maybe where we can find cleaner populations. Yeah. Other questions? There's one that was posted here that I'm gonna read because I think it's fairly broadly important. Uh, I'll just read it, Drew, and you can respond. And it, it has to do with ballast water. The question simply is, how important might ballast water be in spreading disease? Uh, can you speak to that at all? I have no data on that. I don't know at all. Um, that, I just clipped out that news report about maybe the ballast water was involved in the what they think is a bacterium affecting the corals. Uh, it seems like it must be <laughs> important as a, as a vector for some kinds of, you know, spreading some kinds of disease, but I've never seen any data or any uh, evidence for it. So it's one of those black boxes. I'm really, I think, I think you'd all be shocked at how many black boxes we have in the ocean. Um, it's, it's actually pretty amazing how little, how much less we know than we should, than we need to know. Um, yeah. Any other questions or, or discussion? I have one more, but I would prefer to leave it to others of you that might like to chime I in. I see here. a question here. It uh, says, in your little diagram of marine species affected by zoonotic outbreaks, there were no seals or sea lions. Was that because they're not exclusively marine, but cross the marine terrestrial boundary? No, it's just because my little diagram was not comprehensive. There were lots of things that could have been in that diagram that I, that I didn't include. So it was just getting too full. Uh, seals, seals are a really interesting case in terms of the disease ecology um, uh, of the, of the kinds of things that are affecting them. Um, you know, morbidity virus is one of them, which is a pretty interesting disease because it's so close to canine distemper. Um, and there's big questions about 
you know, are there cases uh, where seals have actually been infected by dogs with canine distemper or the, or the other way around? So there, there definitely are very interesting questions about things that cross the marine terrestrial boundary. Um, um, and and the, the seal diseases are one of them. Um, some of the whales have uh, influenza viruses that type out to be quite similar to humans. Uh, so, yeah. Mark, please. Yeah, th thank you very much. I, I forget the diagram, but one of your diagrams sh showed a dramatic drop off almost down to zero. But it, before that, it went up higher. It was the urchin and the pycnopodia. I was wondering if the 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 the, 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 the 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 high increase before it dropped off was related to anything. If that could have been that could have been part of the cause of the drop off. It was uh, I agree with two of them going along and then one went way yeah. up. Yeah. 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 Well you guys were watching carefully. <laughs> uh, yeah. We got a the test coming up. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the simulation of the uh, the levels of the Pycnopodia in Washington State, and before the big decline, there was uh, it's not significant, but there was what looked like a big increase, and that was noted in also in British Columbia. I mean, the numbers, the density of the Pycnopodia before the outbreak was huge, uh, and people did ask the question, you know, was this a sort of a natural cycle uh, of, uh, you know, disease outbreaks in, in very high populations. Um, you know, we don't really know. Uh, that was an interesting question though that uh, Melissa Miner and Pete Ramundi did address in their really beautiful paper uh, for the Pisaster. Um, and they found there was no evidence for there being more death or more disease in places where there had been higher populations of Pisaster. So that's, I'm afraid all, you know, all I can report uh, about that, but it certainly is, a, it's a good question. Um, uh, again, you know, this disease, this particular outbreak, uh, what stands out in my mind is the multi-host nature of it. Most of the um, sea star wasting disease have have been just a single species at, at a time. Um, and this really stood out and then it was absolutely a multi-species hit. Um, interesting that there were some that were resistant. So the leather stars, for example, and the Henrichia, the blood stars seem to actually increase in some of our, some of our studies. So, uh, and then the other thing that was really outstanding in a bad way about the the epidemic was the geographic range. The fact that uh, it started in 2013 on our coast, but uh, in 2011, what's thought to be the same thing happened on the East Coast, maybe even before. Uh, and it took out a lot of the East Coast stars. Um, it was not nearly as well studied ecologically as the West Coast outbreak. Thanks again to you know Pete and Melissa's marine group that really pulled together to do a lot of monitoring, yeah. Drew, I have one last question, uh, unless something else comes up before we sign off. Uh, and it has to do with urchin wasting disease, uh, something we've been interested in quite a bit on this coast because we've seen these huge uh, die offs of sea urchins that are due to a, a, a wasting disease. In, and it's also been shown on the East Coast and probably elsewhere in the world, I know. Uh, the, the interesting thing to me about those is there's some evidence from, a, I know in Nova Scotia and also here in central and southern California for a cyclic nature of that. In other words, the urchins seem to build up to high levels and then there'll be a wasting disease. They fall down and they'll, they'll drop and, and then they'll recover. And then and we've seen those go through various cycles. And that is very reminiscent of sort of a density relationship between mm -hmm. the availability of the pathogen and the availability of distance of infectivity of the hosts and uh, transmissibility, I guess, from individual to individual. 
And I'm wondering, is that, do you think, because it's very species specific, that is it's urchin specific, whereas in the case of the sea star disease, it's multi-host, or do you think something else is going on there? Do you have any, any real idea of what, what's happening there? Um, because that does seem to be in those cases where there are these big urchin wasting disease die-offs, they don't last. I mean, they will, they will, there'll be a recruitment event and the urchins will recover uh, in, in almost all cases that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question, Jim. There's been, I mean, there's, there's been different kinds of urchin um, die-offs. The one that I think we have the best data on being cyclic, maybe you're thinking of, is actually the temperate urchins, and that's known to be an amoeba. So the causative agent is known in that, known in that case. Um, and I actually don't know the answer for why it's cyclic, but I think your explanation is a good one, which is that as the host, you know, as the host builds up, the frequency of the pathogen increases and transmits easily um, among them and then, you know, brings them back down. And so again, if it's a specific relationship, it, it has a tight density dependent regulation. Whereas what's dangerous about these multi-host pathogens is, you know, they, they can drive their most susceptible hosts to extinction because they have a refuge in all the other species that they're infecting. And that includes something like COVID. COVID's a multi-host pathogen, right? I mean, it originated in bats. It affects minks, us, um, cats, I guess. Uh, and so, you know, there's some issues also with that uh, evolving different lineages and different hosts, but it makes it a lot harder to control. Um, and so, yeah, your point is well taken. And I'd have to go look at Scheibling's work on the, um, the, the amoeba, you know, outbreaks in the urchins, but that's, that's the case I know of for that. Now, the, the other big urchin outbreak is the Caribbean one. Uh, the diadema that happened in the 80s. And that is thought to be bacterial, although nobody was able to confirm it at the time. And that's different. That, that's not been cyclic. That, mm -hmm. that happened in the mm, early 80s or mid 80s. And um, they still are not back to the levels they were once. Um, same thing with the heliaster, as I understand it. Mm -hmm. um, they have not come back. Um, so very yeah. interesting. Yeah, well, thank, thank you, Drew. I, I think unless there are others that want to pop in at this point, we'll start to draw this to a close. Uh, not seeing anything, or not hearing anybody, so I think we'll go ahead and do that. Uh, I'd like to thank you so much for taking the time to do this again. Drew, whoops, I see some, oh, there's some hands clapping, so <laughs> thanks so much. Uh, I mean, you're, it's really providing a great service to inform us that the issue of disease in the oceans, obviously, a very relevant adjunct to what we're dealing with in our own daily lives with COVID and, and the, the awareness of disease on land. Uh, so thank you, Drew, for doing that. Uh, I, wanna, I wanna remind all of you that next week, uh, same time, our third lecture is going to be on Lyme disease by Rick Ostfeld. Uh, I can assure you it'll be another scintillating talk, very interesting. I know quite a bit of, the, of that particular literature and, and him personally, it'll be, a, be wonderful. So please come and listen in on that. Uh, another disease that we are, um, uh, uh, that, that affects our lives right here in California, although not so much as in other places. And uh, yeah, with that, I think we'll just go ahead and sign off and, and thanks again, Drew. And I'll look forward to seeing you one of these months or years when we can do that, all right? Indeed. Thank you so much for having me and for all the good questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Nice to see you. you. All. It was great. Appreciate it so much. Uh, very Thank welcome. You. And I'm happy that everybody's going to be so well versed in infectious disease by the end of it. <laughs> well, it's very relevant, isn't it? Universally, too. <laughs> Thanks again, Drew. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye, Drew. Bye. I must hurry.